we've got a couple of questions from our uh, audience today. Uh, Janisha, this question did drop in uh, while you were speaking, but uh, Jason, if you want to chime in as well, you're more than welcome to do so. But do you think that we'll see a significant spike in litigation, uh, ERISA litigation in particular, in light of the COVID pandemic? Or do you think the logistical challenges that present themselves, such as social distancing and what have you, will inadvertently end up just kicking this can further down the road and we'll see a spike at a later date? Jason, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer that one to you. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, my sense is, that we're going to see a ton of COVID litigation. I, I just think it's inevitable. I think this is just too big a shock to the entire economy to think that ERISA somehow is going to, you know, kind of avoid its reverberations. Because, you know, I, I mean, go back to what we, what we maybe were saying five minutes ago, right? If, if, if you think of ERISA, there are, you know, you got the pension plans and you got the health and welfare plans. Well, the health and welfare plans they are directly in the crosshairs of, of COVID because all those reimbursement questions, right? And, and, I mean, it's going to take a while for that stuff to play out. Who's really paying for this care? Uh, is it the government or is it the plans, you know, et cetera? So what are the, how are the plans going to deal with these, with these claims? Are they going to, you know, presumably they're going to cover most of this stuff. What are they going to do on reimbursement rates? I mean, it's, you know, there's a whole mess of, of issues related to how, ERISA of health and welfare plans are going to react to just treating COVID itself. So that's, I think, going to come kind of be, going to be the, the first wave of litigation, which will largely wait. It's going to it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to be, you know, months from now, probably when when after, you know, we sort of start settling into these, these claims start being, you know, submitted and paid and, you know, people start to both providers and, and the plan start to understand what the economic ramifications of it all are. But anyway, my guess is that'll be the first wave of litigation. And then on the heels of that, you're going to have a wave of ERISA litigation on the pension side for the reasons that Janissa was talking about at the beginning, which is that, which is that you're going to have so much market volatility. You already have it. And I assume that's going to continue. And when it does, you're going to have ESOPs and other kinds of investments that are in these ERISA plans that are going to tank. And, you know, people are going to wonder whether or not their fiduciaries did the best job they could um, under the circumstances. So, yes, I, I think, you know, I think everybody, you know, most lawyers I talk to certainly think there's going to be COVID litigation just in every, any space they're in. But I sure think it's going to, it's hard for me to imagine that a risk is not going to be a, a big place where a lot of COVID related things get thought about. Thank you so much. Janisha, this question's for yourself before we wrap things up. In light of the Intel case, uh, what can sponsors do to ensure that plan members receive and indeed acknowledge receipt of disclosures? Uh, sure. So um, and just briefly to recap, in February of this year, the Supreme Court and Intel Corporation Investment Policy Committee versus Selena held that a plaintiff does not necessarily have actual knowledge uh, under Section ERISA Section 1113-2 of the information contained in a disclosure he received but does not call, recall reading. To meet the actual knowledge requirement, the plaintiff must, in fact, have become aware of, of that information. Um, my, my general thought is that planned fiduciaries may want to consider treating disclosures uh, like quick rack agreements um, that require plan participants to acknowledge receipt. Uh, the Supreme Court in Salima did, uh, didn't foreclose the various ways in which a plan, a plan could show that the participant did have knowledge of the disclosure, but um, just like with any 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 litigation relating to uh, privacy policies or or terms, uh, a quick uh, fashioning your disclosure with like quick wrap agreements could possibly be be the way um, to to easily ascertain that evidence. Um, I'd also recommend making sure that disclosures are simple and readable to the average plan participant. Uh, so. Those would, would be some some recommendations um, as for disclosures following Salima. 